to have something uh, be adopted, uh, would it go to the Supreme Court for action? There are in the in the enactment bills. Uh, Senator Lucas had the bill in the Senate and Senate Bill 203. Uh, sort of specify what the requirements would be of this, uh, the Supreme Court uh, in that process uh, as we've developed things that would be implementing the constitutional amendment itself there. Uh, so I think it's something that is uh, positive, and I think it's something that would be uh, well received by the uh, by the public. I think it's something that is fair uh, to the parties that are involved, including both political parties, uh, in terms of balance there. I think it's fair in terms of its involvement of citizens in the process in ways in which they have not necessarily been involved in the past. So I think there are a lot of positive things about this. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about it now, but I'd be happy to answer any, any questions uh, anyone might have. All right. Question from any member of the committee. Delegate Simon. I was a question for the patron. So th there's a couple of different ways that this bill could go wrong. As far as I'm sorry, that go wrong, but let's say it this way. Uh, you said there's two opportunities for the House members to vote on a map. They get two tries. But, but isn't there another way that, that the, the commission could end up not getting to a map at all? Or, or can you tell us a little about the different things that might happen and the different ways that the commission might end up not being able to draft the map itself? What, what, what would have to happen for the commission not to be able to draft a map? Is that a clear enough question? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the commission is charged with dra dra drafting a map. Uh, and, you know, as it relates to us, it would be the House of Delegates and the State Senate Districts, which are those that have to be done first. The congressional districts are less time sensitive because uh, Congress won't be up for uh, for re-election in Virginia in, in 2021. They will be, won't be until 2022 where they would be up. Uh, there's a 45-day time frame for the proceeding uh, to develop a map. Uh, there are 16 members of the commission, eight citizens, eight legislators. The eight legislators are four Republicans, four Democrats there. And there is a requirement uh, that you have super majorities of uh, both the citizens and the legislators there. That so you would have to have six out of the eight legislators support it. So you could not have one Democrat that sided with the four Republicans or one Republican that sided with the four Democrats uh, to be able to skew it in a partisan uh, direction there. Uh, similarly, we you know, gave the same, same protection to the citizens and that you have to have six of the eight citizen members that are part of the process that, that, to vote for a map there. Mm -hmm. So if you did not get six votes uh, out of uh, the, either the, the legislators or the citizens, uh, then you would not have a map that would be able to go to the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. So that is certainly an option, certainly something would, would be there. Uh, my sense in, uh, in terms of sort of working on these types of things and uh, understanding what has happened in other states is when you have both political parties with a vested interest uh, up with something, and, and by and large, what you have here is a situation where uh, there's protections built in for both political parties. That, in general, you know, there is it, a, a agreement can be reached fairly quickly to be able to move forward on these types of things. But it doesn't mean it. it but there is that that possibility that you would not be able to get to six votes. Uh, the second uh, thing that you referred to was that uh, once the commission develops a map, it goes back to it goes to the general assembly. The General Assembly cannot make a, any changes to the maps, but uh, would have an up or down vote uh, in the House and, and the Senate on that. And if either body uh, re rejected that, then it would go back to the Commission for a second go round. Now, we did in 2011 have the maps that dealt with House of Delegates, state Senate districts uh, were vetoed by the governor. So we went, had to go back through the process a little bit, but we sort of had a little better understanding of sort of what some of the issues were and how that could be handled. And, and it can be done within the time frame that's available to us. Mr. Chairman, follow-up question? Delegate Simon. So, so the way this is set up also, either political party essentially, if the two, if the two legislative members of the same political party decide to veto the commission's work essentially and get together, any, either the two Republicans or the two Democrats could get together and say, we don't like this map and we want to kick it over to the Supreme Court. Is that right? No, what you have is actually you have a, it's a, a broader context because there are eight legislators, four Republicans and four Democrats. Uh, and if you had two from one political party, as long as the four from the other political party that voted in favor of it, it would move forward. The protection on the two that you're talking about is for, uh, for example, and if, if it were those of us who were Democrats, uh, this, w those of us in the Senate could not draw a map that disfavored the House Democrats and and be able to uh, have both House Democrats vote against it, but not be able to kill it uh, if the two Senate members uh, and the four Republicans voted in favor of it. So that's where the protection is built in. 
you know, what we try to do is put as many protections in there so that there would not be uh, situations uh, very likely to occur where there would be uh, a fa an inability to reach consensus and, and a map that could pass, uh, could pass muster with the commission itself. Uh, the last thing we want is to have a process set up that is balanced and fair but doesn't reach, reach a conclusion that, uh, that reflects that. And so that's why we tried to make sure that we had the ability to be able to build in uh, those protections throughout the process. Uh, and I think we, you know, this, what this does is by having these supermajorities, it does that uh, in, this, in this particular situation. And I think it makes it much more likely that we would be able to come up with a map that uh, is fair and balanced between the two political parties and is also reflective of the concerns that citizens have and is reflective of trying to deal with communities of interest and those types of things and is responsive to the issues related to race, uh, language minorities, and others so that we are taking care of all the types of issues uh, that need to be taken care of. Delegate Price. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, so I just, I, this wasn't, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of questions. Delegate this Price. wasn't one of my questions, but I just wanted to make sure that I heard you. So did you say that, in fact, two legislators from the same party cannot stall the process get over to the courts? Not it, 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 uh, you cannot have, if, you, you have to have six of the eight legislators voting for it, which would mean you'd have to have at least uh, you know, either three and three or four and two. If you had four and two, that would not necessarily block it unless the two that were against it were both members of the same body and the same party there. And that was put in basically so that, uh, you know, if, for example, those of us who are Democrats uh, were, are, are fighting a little bit between the House and the Senate, uh, we can't draw a map. That never happens. That would never happen. No, never, no, no. Never. It, ne it never has happened in the past. So. Uh, but it, you could not draw a map whereby the two Senate members would impose upon the two House Democrats a map that was highly unfavorable to the to the House Democrats there. So that's why that protection was built into the process there. Mr. Chairman. Delegate Price. So if I may, if I may word it a different way, because I'm not necessarily worried about the two bicameral pieces, but the statement has been made that it is bipartisan in nature. So my question is more of, in a party, could two legislators from the same party thwart the process and kick the map drawing process to the Supreme Court? Only if the two legislators from the same party are in the same body. So it would be two of the same party in the House or two of the same party in the Senate. And that was put in basically to try to protect the against them. And for example, I mean, in, in the... Uh, you know, in the late 1990s, uh, when Gilmore was governor, uh, there was extraordinary tensions between the Senate Republicans and the House Republicans. And in an environment like that, you could have had one of the two basically sort of work with the other side to come up with something that would penalize the other body from the same party. So we wanted to make sure that we had protections built in uh, against that being able to happen here. So, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Price. So, um, and Senator, in a lot of the communication that I've been receiving, something that's been mentioned is that protections for voting rights, and I think you just mentioned communities of interest, yes. are enshrined in the actual amendment. Can you please show me where that is in the amendment well, actually, language? Actually, a lot of what I referenced was what uh, that we've been working on this session in terms of the enactment enacting legislation. Right. So, but, for example, the, Sen Senator... Uh, uh, Senator Lucas's Senate Bill 203 has a lot of that as well as I think. You know, I definitely understand, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so my, my actual question is based on the communications that I've been receiving, not from you, right. not from any of the senators, right. but from some of the advocates, is that the voting rights protections are enshrined in the language of the amendment. And so that's where I was going to see if you agree with that or if you don't. And if you did agree with that, if you could point me in the right direction to finding that. Yes, actually, if, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, if you look at the very beginning of uh, what is there uh, on line 22, it says Section 6 apportionment. And then under that is a paragraph from, section, from lines 23 through 32 that do uh, address federal and state laws that address racial and ethnic fairness 
including the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the U.S. and provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as amended, judicial and judicial decisions interpreting such laws. So that's where some of the uh, broad framework is there. And certainly, as you know, uh, the enacting legislation, we have more specific language that's there to, to address those issues and make sure that there is, uh, you know, that there are the full protections, full opportunity in terms of voting, uh, the ability uh, to vote, uh, full protections in terms of being able to elect, uh, where there are a large enough number, uh, elect a, a person of uh, that, that, that is consistent with the choice of a racial or a language minority that would be in place there. And so we've been, we've been dealing with those for a number of years, and, and this would make sure that we would, this would lock it in in a more comprehensive fashion here, uh, and we certainly build on that with enacting legislation. Delegate Price. So I definitely see where they are referenced, yes. but I don't see the actual pieces that they enshrine, it would be enshrined. So say, for instance, I know that the federal level is very interested in seeing what it could do to um, further gut the Voting Rights Amendment. So if the Voting Rights Amendment was further gutted, would the protections that are in there today be applicable to this constitutional amendment? Uh, what this states here is that the provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as amended. So therefore, if that were thrown out by the court, uh, it would be incumbent upon us to try to do something to address that issue, since there would then be a gap in terms of the things that are now providing protections. Just as, as if we repealed the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, we would have to do things there. Now, obviously, there's not the threat to the 14th Amendment of the Constitution being uh, challenged in the same way, but I do recognize certainly the legitimacy of, we, of your concern as it relates to some of the actions that have already been taken by the Supreme Court, the failure of Congress to update the standards in the Voting Rights Act, which should have been done decades ago. And so I think that what we need to do is be vigilant on that type of thing and make sure that we have provisions in our code and, and be able to address some of these types of, uh, of issues throughout the process and that we are uh, highly responsive should there be something that happens to to weaken further the Voting Rights Act, which did get weakened, you know, less than a decade ago now. So, Mr. Chairman, I promise I only have two more questions. Delegate Price, and so, both of your two questions. Thank you. Um, <laughs> leave you out of it. Um, so, so with that and those same lines, is it my correct understanding that in lines 25 through 30, where these five aspects are referenced but not the language, are those the only pieces of criteria for how the district shall be drawn included in the language of the amendment? Uh, yes, I think they are the ones that sort of provide the framework in the, in the amendment. Generally, what you have in, in terms of when you do a constitutional amendment is to have sort of the broad framework for it, and then you have the enacting legislation to be able to implement it. And obviously there can be amendments, you know, changes to that legislation over time. And last question. Um, Senator, last week we had a hearty discussion about the potential timeline yeah. uh, and the amendment language really basing the timeline on an unknown because we don't know the exact date that we will receive the census data. And I was wondering because I know that um, I believe it was I won't say the name, but I, I believe it was Delegate Orock or someone yes. that was opining about a time where we had to have three elections because the maps may not have been done. So I was wondering if included in were budgetary considerations for localities that may have to have um, elections in 2021, 2022, and 2023 based on this timeline. Uh, well, certainly the, the example that uh, Delegate Orock referred to was back in the early 